So to start off then, um, would you be able to just introduce yourself, um, your name, pronouns, anything else you'd like to share, and then give us a little bit of information on your uh, current job description? Okay, sure. Uh, my name is Adrienne Kane. Um, I am a librarian, certified archivist, and oral historian. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, and right now I'm working as the assistant director for the Institute for Oral History at Baylor University. We are a part of Baylor Libraries, which I think we can segue into this is a very interesting um, story because my background, I, before I was here, I worked with Houston Public Library as an oral history librarian. And then I got here. So my department originally was a standalone department under academic affairs, the whole tier or whatnot. And in 2019, we were, um, I'll say acquired by Baylor Libraries. So I make the joke that it's like, I left the library, but I ended up back in the library. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, it's funny, but it's, uh, it's, I'm at home because, you know, with being in special collections, that's where I've always worked. Um, but it's just funny that it's like, I left. How did I, how did I get back here? Like, let this happen. Who let this happen? Yeah. So Great. I am at now and I've been here for five years going into my sixth year. Nice. Awesome. Would you be able, so you mentioned working with special collections. So what is kind of a typical day on the job look like for you? And um, what, how does digital work factor into your job? There is no typical day. Um, so I will say that's one thing I learned um, going from like public library to an academic library. It's, it's different. I can say that when I was with the public library doing the same, well, similar work, it was very like, okay, I knew I had this many hours on the reference desk, this much time to devote to um, collection development, this much time to actually conduct interviews. So it was very structured in this, in that way. Um, here, there are a lot more responsibilities and a lot more fluctuations in what you do. So the typical day is like, eh, what is a typical day? <laughs> so um, what I will say that I do a lot of um, is that we have a, we do a semi-annual <laughs> workshop um, getting with oral history. So um, usually we're tweaking our, our work and our presentations for that. Um, also, I do a lot of workshops for community groups, um, students, institutions that are wanting to start oral history programs. Um, also doing uh, consulting. So there are some other academic institutions and also some um, other nonprofits that will consult with me to ask if I could help out with their collection development, with their um, literal collection development, like not in the library sense of like, hey, we're trying to start this program. How do we do this? Um, also, one of the interesting things about us is that um, we have also our internal client, well, what we call our internal clients, which are like Baylor faculty, staff, and students um, who are doing research who are using our oral histories for research, who are wanting to create their own oral histories for their research. But we also have external clients. So like community groups, um, local libraries, um, people across the state and across the country who are wanting to do that as well. So we have like both ends that we're fulfilling. Um, so it's a lot of um, fielding questions. Um, and it could be your simple, I guess what we used to call a directional question in the library is like, oh, how do I find X, Y, Z? It's like, enter this into the search field type of thing. So um, it can, it varies. So to make a, a long answer short, it varies. Um, it depends upon who I'm interacting with, what their needs are, um, what the needs for the department are for the day. Um, it, it, it's a range of what a typical day can, can look like. That could be one thing of advice for someone who's going through this journey. It's like, oh, I'll have a day like this. No, you won't. There is no typical day. Things happen, things come up, which is, which I guess makes it fun. And because you never really know what your, what journey you're going to go on or what rabbit hole you may 
go down with, with someone. <laughs> um, and the people that you meet are, are so interesting. Um, so for me, especially doing interviews or interviewing people, just hearing their life stories, you're just like, oh, wow, you, you did that or you were involved with that. And just seeing people relive their memories and, you know, share things that they haven't talked about for decades, maybe that's, that's the fun part. Cause you're like, oh, wow, this is, this is cool. This is something I would have never known had I never encountered this person. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you have any um, favorite kinds of interviews or like a memorable oral history project that you worked on or one that just sticks in your mind? One of my favorite interviews that I did was when I was with Houston Public Library and I was with the special collection that is uh, named the African American Library at the Gregory School in Houston, Texas. Um, I interviewed Constable May Walker and Constable May Walker was the first black female, I want to say possibly even first female constable for uh, Harris County in Houston. And she was just telling me about her experience um, being on the police force, like how she got on the police force. So she um, had heard on the radio that, and this was like in the early seventies, she had heard on the radio that, you know, Houston police department had um, integrated in terms of gender. Um, I'm not sure if there's a, a, another term for that, that's specifically for gender integration, but yeah. So they were accepting women on the police force um, for the first time and that they were having these trainings. So if you were interested, you know, you could apply. And so she did. She was just like, hey, I needed a job. <laughs> That's what it was. But um, just the her telling the stories of like what it was like, the intersectionality of it, like not only being a woman, but also being a black woman, how that played out, like um, how the officers would have like team meetings in the men's locker room. And, you know, she's not technically allowed in there or how even there wasn't a woman's dressing room at the time because there were no women. Um, and the most amazing thing that she had told me was basically how she was assigned this partner who didn't care for her. He was just like, you know, I'm only doing this because my job requires it. But they were out um, and received a call and they went to the address and it was, uh, I want to say attempted robbery. And he went around the front, she ran, went around the back, um, found this, the guy, um, wrestled him down to the ground, had two of her teeth knocked out, like it was a, a scuffle. And after that, after they apprehended the suspect, all of this stuff, like her partner was like, yeah, okay, now I can respect you. And it's like, so you had to get your teeth knocked out, <laughs> be, be down to the ground for you know, your male counterpart to respect you as as an officer so just her stories of of that and just all that she went through just you know being that pioneer class of women in the police field and to end up being a constable like was a pretty big deal she was just fun to talk to so you had mentioned that you were at Houston Public Library before this um could you talk a little bit more about your educational and career background and kind of that journey that brought you to where you are now? Yes, it's a fun journey. It's actually quite a funny story um, because I will not say that I fell into this, but there, there are a lot of wonderful coincidences. Um, or if you're of the religious vein, you know, God placed me in some really great places. Um, so I will start by saying, growing up, I wanted to be an astronaut. I promise you there's a point there's a point to this okay so um and then calculus and physics I dream very quickly it was just like okay this is this is not my ministry this is not going to work for me so I um went into undergrad um my I went to HBCU in um Prairie, Prairie View A&M University Prairie View Texas um and I had entered honestly I had put civil engineering going into 
I didn't want to do that. I didn't even know what that was. It just sounded like something that would make money and that was cool. So quickly after I got there, my first semester, like I took all my basics. I was lucky enough to start off with a 4.0. And I was just like, mm, I'm, I'm not doing engineering because you know what? It has math and I don't want it to do that. So I changed to, I think I was going to go into education, but I took a few more classes. It was like the way that this was 2003, so I was in undergrad 2003 to graduated 2007 um and at that time it's like teaching had really went to like standardized testing being the focus um and it really went to like teachers having less flexibility in the classroom so like my experience of the wonderful and not so wonderful teachers that I had you know the creativity of it was like going down so it's like okay that doesn't seem fun so I've always been a nerd. I've always loved libraries and museums. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to double major in English and history. At the time I had a minor in Spanish. I was very ambitious <laughs> and um, went through with that. Absolutely loved it. But then it was like, okay, it's time to graduate. And I graduated in 07. Um, this was like right before one of those great recessions that we had. <laughs> and I think that, um, looking back on it now, you know, you are told this story of college, of what it's like. So my thought was like, okay, I'm getting ready to graduate. Companies are going to, are going to come find me to work for them because that's how it works, right? You go to college and people like hearing, hearing me say that now, it sounds absolutely ridiculous, but there was a point in time where it was just like this, this, kind of fantasy that was fed to you of like, oh yeah, you go to school, you're automatically going to get a job. But it's like, how? <laughs> and it wasn't like, again, I was computer science or engineer. I was English and history. So it was like, okay, so I could teach, which I really didn't want to do. But then I was like, okay, at the time, I've always been fascinated and interesting in, in museum curation. But at this time, again, 2007, there wasn't a clear cut path to that. So you either went to grad school for art history or you went to grad school for library science and you worked your way to it that, to that way. Now there's so many programs and stuff to where it's like, you know, you can get there. But then it was just like, okay, you have to work your way up. I was already behind. I should have started internships when I was 12 to have one gotten a job that in a museum or whatnot. So um, graduated from PV, uh, dropped the minor because I would have been there for two more semesters. And um, I enrolled in uh, the library science program at University of North Texas um, because I couldn't move back in with my parents. I grew up in Fort Worth. And, hey, just being, just being honest at the time, it's like, what are your options? Um, I got a full-time job. I worked for a collections department at Mercedes-Benz Financial. So there's some life lessons in that. <laughs> it's very fun. Um, so yeah, I was working full-time commuting uh, to UNT, which is probably about an hour, probably 45 minutes from my job, but like an hour 15 from home. Um, hey, you did what you do we have to do because <laughs> I had free rent, so I was I was cool. Um, so I did that, and then that was I started there January 20, 2008. And then where was I? Um, I want to say spring 2010, I was still working, finishing up my program, and I needed a practicum. I had to go get an internship somewhere. And to be honest, that was scary because at that point we were full on in the recession, like, you know, 08 housing market crashed. Things were, were not so great. Um, it wasn't like a, a um, it wouldn't have been a wise decision to leave a full-time job with benefits and decent pay for an internship that, you know, at that time, internships are, are I will say they're better now. But I was definitely then it was like, you just took it with the understanding of like, it's an unpaid internship or the pay is going to be crappy. 
So I was looking on the job board, um, the internship board, excuse me, for um, our graduate program. Lo and behold, there was this thing for NASA Johnson Space Center with their history office. Right. <laughs> so I was like, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to shoot my shot. I'm going to try out for it. Let's see what happens. Um, I got the internship, ended up turning that into a two term internship. Um, it was very well funded and I was able to find co-op housing. So that all worked out. So while there, my first tour, they call them tours, first tour was with the history office um, and which is now defunct at Johnson Space Center, which I'm like, how do you get rid of your history office? It's the history office, but whatever. Um, and so we were in there digging the archive. Um, at the point in time, the shuttle program was ending and NASA had an MOU with um, National Archives that, you know, three years after a program is done, all of the materials has to be turned over to them. Well, nobody thought the shuttle program was going to end. So you have all of these things that needed to be digitized very quickly. Um, so we called it the summer of staples for a long time because it's like we were unscrewing like manuals. We had to make sure we had our tetanus shot, but there were cool things because it's like you have, um, what was it? Like astronaut suit designs from like, Neiman Market, like all these fancy designers, like this is how the space suits should look. Um, you had um, all of these letters from, there was a group of letters from um, women who were against alcohol, like prohibition. So even in the 60s, they were like, you know, protesting, like, you know, you shouldn't allow wine to go to be on the menu when you're in space. Like, that's just like the craziest thing, but there were written letters from these movements. Um, and I think also because of the partnership with the uh, Soyuz program with the cosmonauts, Russian um, astronauts. And there was like talk about, you know, vodka is like the devil's juice. You know, you can't have that on space. Crazy stuff, cool stuff, but you're just like, wow and you see like flight director notes with coffee rings on them and you're just like this this was this person's personal no it was it was really cool like you geeked out so we spent a lot of time at the archive um and there they had an oral history program so they knew that that was kind of boring for us to be pulling staples all day so we would take breaks and like go to um university of houston clear lake which had a large chunk of their archives as well and they would show us different things and talk to us about different programs. That's where I learned about oral history. It's just one of those things that was like introduced to me. Um, like, oh yeah, so this is where we, you know, sit down, we have interviews with former astronauts, former flight directors, all of this cool stuff. And I was just like, oh, that's cool. It kind of stuck with me, but I didn't know why. I was just like, oh, that seems interesting. So um, finished that tour. My second tour was with the photo and video archives at NASA. Um, so, 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 so much fun, um, until, cause it was like one of the programs that they had, they had like these old, um, negatives that they needed to digitize. And the first one that I got was, uh, digitizing, um, photos of moon rocks. Right. It seems cool at first, but when you get to like your 27 picture of the same brown beige rock. It's like, okay. But the cool thing is that that gave me experience with Internet Archive because that's where they uploaded their um, photographs once they were digitized. I learned naming conventions. I learned about file formats. I learned a lot of stuff. So at that time, um, and I still keep in contact with my mentor that I had there. Uh, she was like, you know, we never thought about having a life librarian on staff like this is actually pretty cool and it makes sense and I'm like yes it does you should hire me um so I was scheduled to graduate um December 17th 2010 was my graduation date and um 
I want to say in November of that year is when the current administration had announced that they were doing furloughs or there was hiring freeze. So there goes my dreams, hopes, and aspirations. <laughs> it's kind of like shut down, which I get things happen. Um, but to be honest with you, I'm kind of happy that didn't happen because the way that it turned out is like that office doesn't know it no longer exists now. Fast forward a couple of years, I'm interviewing for the position at Houston Public Library, and it's just like a librarian one position, not too much detail. And in the interview, um, a lady asked me, oh, um, by the way, it's missing a little random, but by the way, do you know anything about oral history? Why? Why, yes, I do. I do. And I told her, you know, I've never practiced it, but I am aware of it, the importance of it, um, the gist of it, basically. And she was like, okay, cool. So fun story is that when I was hired for that position, I needed training. So the workshop that I took for training is actually the workshop that I teach now, which is like full circle kind of cool things like, oh, wow. I guess building off that with all the, the winding road to get to where you currently are, what kind of like keeps you motivated to keep working in this field and to keep working with digital library work? What keeps me motivated, motivated is that I honestly truly love what I do. And I kind of feel like, a, not a fraud, but it's just like when you're talking about it specifically like being digital library work or digital librarianship, it's like, I don't see it any different as regular librarianship. It's just the fact that the materials and the collections I deal with just so happen to be digital. And that's being completely honest. That's how I kind of get categorized in this. It's like, because if I were still doing, you know, cassette tape recordings or whatever, would it still, well, technically it was still, we're not gonna go down the rabbit hole. Technically it would, but you know what I mean? It's just like, it just so happens that my material is digital and my collections are digital. So it does get under that umbrella of digital librarianship. But I, I never looked at myself as like a digital librarian. Um, and what's funny with that is that um, we just wrapped up like a, um, I'm on the search committee for a digital humanities librarian. And so it's like, when I look at that description and that lens, it's like, oh, wow, this is cool. But also it's, it's like the same, it's still humanities. It's just that the material happens to be digital. So um, when you say that for me, it's just like, well, I, I have loved librarianship. Um, being a librarian has actually led me to all of these things with becoming a certified archivist, with being an oral historian. And the, the work, and I feel the true importance of it is just like letting people know the importance of oral history, um, the the importance of preserving oral histories um, and making sure that they're accessible. So I'll say the same thing any librarian has to deal with, you know, accessibility, preservation, and for us, especially dealing with or expecting obsolescence. Like for example, um, luckily with oral history, audio files have a standard format of, you know, wave format, that's our standard. But when it comes to video formats, they're like umpteen thousand, different formats. So like, there's no standardization of that. So we have to in turn, like prepare for the fact like, hey, this is already ancient, but this thumb drive in what, probably two years, who knows, is going to be, you know, inaccessible. Like even now, like how we felt with CDs and DVDs, like we don't, we don't even use those anymore. Our laptops don't even come with CD or DVD drives anymore. So how do we prepare for that being something that's not available? And like I said, that's not unique to oral historians or oral history librarians. That's librarianship all around. Like how do we 
continue to provide access to these materials? Um, how do we best store these materials so that they're available 10, 20, 30 years from now? Um, and what can we do to make that access easier? What do you, what challenges do you think will pop up or continue in the next like five years? And like, how do you think sort of your field is going to change? Um, well, I will say one thing that we've already experienced, of course, with uh, the current pandemic is that um, with oral history, we really value like in-person interviews. But as you notice, this is the, the norm now. And so just um, there are quite a few studies that are have been done and that are still being done about does this take away like what is gained from doing interviews remotely? Um, what is taken away? How do we adapt? How do we work with this? Um, even with if we're talking about library instruction or providing services, how does this work? Like, is this going to be the new reference interview? It's probably already is the reference interview now, to be honest with you. Um, but just how, how are we going to adapt to that? Also with this, um, we have to be cognizant of the digital divide. So yes, it's really cool that we can do all these things online. Yes, it's really cool that we can provide all this um, access via the internet. But we have to be mindful of the populations that aren't able to access. Maybe they're in a rural area. Maybe they cannot afford it. Maybe it's not something that is readily accessible to them. So how do we still provide service to those patrons? Like, let's not get too... And I think this is something that kind of trends every few years of like, okay, yes, it's really cool that we can do all this stuff, but let's also make sure that we're staying true to our core values. So yes, we can put all of these digital projects up and do X, Y, Z and Python coding. I don't know how to do that. I admire anyone who does, but all of this stuff, right? But then how accessible is it? It seems very accessible, but on the grand scheme of things, are we um, preventing or are we excluding populations by doing that? Um, also, we have to be honest with the fact that, okay, yes, we can create all of these digital materials and digital projects. Where are they gonna go? I think sometimes that um, when we think about uh, digital library or things being digital, like people just think like, oh, okay, you know, it's in the club. It's fine. It's cool. It's like, no, these things take up space, a lot of space. And that space has to come from somewhere, right? It has to go somewhere. So um, that's going to be a challenge because we are, there was a certain threshold that we have passed of like, how much digital material do we have accessible to people? And again, the intent behind it is, is good because it's like, oh, access for all. But at what cost? Like five years from now, who's gonna care about the Omeka project that you did on geese in the South? Yeah, I don't know, just something random. It's just like, okay, so, we also need to think about what is our, um, like with books in the physical library, you know, sometimes you have to weed, which I always got anxiety about. Cause I was like, man, what if I, what if I'm that one person that weeds that one book that really shouldn't have been taken out anyway. Um, but we have to think about that in the digital aspect as well. Like, okay, so what things maybe need to be quote unquote decommissioned or, do we have to have all of this stuff? Which is why I give a shout out to like Texas Digital Libraries because it's like, you know, you have these consortiums where you can share all of these. So it's like, no, I don't need to have all of these things. This library here has it. I can access theirs or something like that. But I think that um, space is going to become an issue. Um, again, preservation, how are we 
going to make sure these are available. Um, and again, the whole access thing of how are we providing access? How is that going to change? Because it is going to change. I mean, I graduated uh, with my master's in library science 10, almost 11 years ago. And the, the stuff that has changed since then is just like, wow, okay. I feel really old sometimes because like there are certain concepts that I wouldn't have even imagined or thought of 10 years from now. Like they were doubting RDA was gonna happen um, when I was in getting ready to graduate. I just took the extra cataloging class because I thought it was, I was one of those weirdos that that cataloging was fun. So I took the extra class because I was like, oh, well, this is cool. And I remember my professor saying, yeah, you probably won't need it because they're never going to go through with it. Where are we at now? <laughs> so, yeah, that's. And as librarians, I think we are always up for that challenge. We are some of the most creative, innovative people ever. We're problem solvers. So we will definitely figure it out. It's just that, you know, and I think even you asking that question, we're aware of these issues um, and we'll figure it out. Um, it's just that there's something always changing. Formats are changing. Um, access is changing. Uh, YouTube probably won't be YouTube 20 years from now. So how are we gonna handle all of those items that are there? What are we gonna do with it? What's gonna happen when YouTube runs out of space? I know it seems inconceivable, but <laughs> you know, what are we gonna do then? And those are, I think those are definitely gonna be the challenges that we have to address in the next, I would say two to five years. <laughs> yeah. So based on kind of just the challenges that you talked about, your own experience working with digital items, what would you think are some of the more valuable things that like LIS and MSIS programs could be teaching? Their students right now or what advice would you have for students who are kind of in the process of going through school and hoping to work with digital items know that everything that you learn you're you're learning these things in ideal scenarios like um for example some of the preservation classes that i took while um in school it's like, you know, you're assuming that you have dehumidifiers and you have <laughs> all of these resources and, and that you're able to do this. So just, I'm not saying forget all that stuff because it is important, but once you get to actually doing the work, know that, that you, have to, you have to adjust some things. <laughs> things may change a little bit. You know, it may not be just like the book or the manual said. Um, if students who are wanting to go that digital route, I will say if you have not taken coding classes or any basic, just do it because um, it will definitely give you a leg up. Um, know that there are positions out there that are looking for your skills. Um, you know, every couple of years, some, I can't say what I want to say, some idiot is posting like these I just saw it the other day and I was like people have no idea what they're talking about like jobs that won't exist um five or ten years from now and it's like y'all said this almost every year for the past 17 years no because like I'm when um the whole thing with like ebooks like e-readers started and everybody was like oh well all the libraries are going to be gone because you don't need books anymore it's just like how how special can you be like that's, that's not that's not true and so yeah like that was one of the jobs like librarians will no longer be needed um five to ten years from now and that just goes to show you the <laughs> how much they don't know um, because like people have this ideal of like a traditional librarian, which is the 
angry old lady with glasses telling everybody to be quiet. And it's like, no, your libraries today are, are community hubs. Like your library is not just a library. It's a, depending where you are, community center. It's a digital repository. It's a maker space. It's all of these things wrapped in one. And as librarians, we have to be like prepared for all of that, depending on which um, type of library you go into. But um, know that digital librarianship is something that is appreciated. It is something that is needed. Um, when you are getting out there and getting ready for your job search, don't let the librarian title box you in because the the skills that we have are ridiculous like if you really t like take away the title and just put a, a make a list of like all of the skills that you acquire through this program you have problem solving you have emergency preparedness you have all of these things that are marketable to so many companies um that's why you have librarians who are, you know, you have your traditional like law libraries, you have your medical librarians, you have this, but you have like librarians working for Google, you have librarians working for startups, you have all of these things that are accessible to you, you just have to know how to market those skills. So making sure I'm staying on track, that is the advice that I would give. Um, part of the advice that I would give to, to students who are interested in it. So take coding, know how to market your skills, and also there was a third one. Oh, and know that what you learn in theories can sometimes just go out the window when it's in actual practice, so. Is there anything that like we didn't cover that you'd like to kind of include in this interview? Anything about digital librarianship that you'd like the viewers to know? Yeah, I would say to really like, explore those options try different things so like I said I ended up in oral history and it's been really great um so if there's something that that piques your interest there is a way to to use your skills and to go to use that and and have a career in that um so just explore find out what you like um Librarians are awesome. Like we know that, but we we really are. Um, also, don't get too upset when you're seeing someone. They're like, "Oh, you need a master's degree to be a librarian." It's coming. Just know that it it is coming. Don't don't get too upset. And um, yeah, just the possibilities are endless. That's one of the great things about this career. It's like there's so many things that you can do. It's really great. I would give a shout out to oral history. So if you want to try it, ever interested in it, using it for your research, there are tons of interesting programs across the country. I will say ours is the best, but that's a little biased. But yeah, just, just go for your interest. Um, find your passion and, and you can always find a way to, to work these, those together, librarianship and whatever your passion is. Unless it's like not being a librarian, then you got to work on that. I don't know how we're going to help you with that. <laughs>